So when we read these apostolic canons, there are things that we definitely want to be mindful of, to take and to embrace, but also there are some things that we also want to be mindful of that are part of the opinions of the apostles as well. So we always want to make a point. Torah is our foundation. Everyone say Torah. Torah, Torah. is the foundation. Is the, the foundation. foundation. Torah is the foundation. So um, let's uh, begin at Canon number fifty-two. And while I'm doing it, I want to ask for someone to get, if you don't mind, can you get me a cup of tea? That's my interjection. I just need a cup of tea. Help me out. Canon number fifty-two. And the canon reads that they shall not listen to the testimony of a heretic against a bishop and shall not listen to a single person or just one person. The testimony of a heretic shall not be received against a bishop and the testimony of a single person shall not be received for in quotes everything shall stand by the mouth of two or three nor shall it be lawful for a bishop to bestow the office of bishop upon his brother or his son or his kindred, nor shall he ordain whomsoever he pleases. For it is not right that the Episcopal dignity shall be inherited, nor shall he give away the property of the Lord for the sake of the will of men. For it is not allowed to make the Church of Christ or the Congregation of Mashiach and Inheritance. For if they do this, and this take to themselves of the office, they will be as though they were not or nothing. And the guilty one himself shall be condemned by a punishment. He who is one-eyed or lame in his foot and is worthy of the Episcopal honor shall be ordained. For a defect of the body does not corrupt him, but a defect of the soul does. A deaf and a blind man, however, shall not be ordained as a bishop not as being unclean, but lest the property of the congregation be scattered. He who is possessed of a devil shall not be ordained, and he shall not pray with the believers. And if he is purified, they shall admit him. And if he be worthy, he may be ordained as one of the clergy. Thank you. Canon number 53. He who has lately been baptized shall not be ordained as a bishop. He who has come from among the Gentiles or has been living in sins and has been baptized shall not be ordained as bishop at once. Nor is it allowed that he who has not been tried shall become the teacher of other men, but he shall become this by the grace of Elohim. Nor shall it be allowed the bishop that he shall gather and accumulate wealth, but he shall be found to be a servant of the congregation. But if not, 
he shall not perform Episcopal functions. Mm -hmm. There is no one who can serve two masters according to the command of our Lord. Mm -hmm. And we command that no servant shall be ordained but with the consent of his master lest his master be offended. For in this way, the families are diminished. If ever there is found a servant in his time who is worthy of the station of ordination, as there has appeared to us Onesimus, and his master sets him free and lets him go forth from his family, let him be ordained. Mm -hmm. Canon number 54. A bishop or an elder or deacon who, con who connects himself with the army and desires to perform these two offices that he should follow a human calling and a priestly calling, let him be expelled. For it is said, give unto the Lord that which is the Lord's, and unto the king that which is the king's. Mm -hmm. He who despises the king or the magistrate, except with justice, let him be punished. <clears throat> it says, uh, except with justice, him they shall punish. And if it be one of the clergy, he shall be deposed. And if a layman, he shall be expelled. Now, as we go back and look at canon number uh, 52, in order for us to properly understand canon 52, we need to consider canon 51 because these two canons go together. Canon 52 is a continuation from Canon 51 as it has to concern itself with bishops who have committed sins and disqualified themselves for serving in the office of oversight. When you look at Canon 51, it discusses that and it discusses how that the pastoral overseer is to be brought before other bishops and then there is correction administered. However, if the bishop does not respond to the correction, then that person will immediately be removed from office. Now in canon number 52, it gives the description of those individuals that may bring accusations. And that's where Canon 52 begins to deal with, like where it says that they shall not listen to the testimony of a heretic. So if it's a heretic that's bringing an accusation against the bishop, that testimony is not to be considered. If it is the testimony of just a single person, then that is not to be considered. Uh, in the scriptures, the text of scripture says, rebuke or reprove or accuse not an elder except it be from the mouth of two or three witnesses. So the rule of thumb has always been out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything is to be established. This is the rule of judgment. So in cases where accusations are brought to the congregation about the bishop, if it's a heretic, it's not to be received. If it is only one person making the accusation, then it will be in question and not received. Um, also, in canon number 52, it deals with the whole idea of the bishop passing on 
the office to a relative. And when it comes to the offices of ministry, the replacement of a person who oversees a congregation is not something that happens simply by the previous leader saying, I wanted to go to this person, or I wanted to go to that person. Mm -hmm. um, the governmental structure in the ancient time was such that the consideration, there were considerations that would be taken by <clears throat> those who were in the previous leadership. There would be considerations that would be taken by those who were in the congregation. But ultimately, the installing and the final decision of those who will be placed in those offices of ministry oversight would come by the other bishops, and in particular, the metropolitan, who would be the overseeing bishop of the pastor of the congregation. So that's where the lines of authority would fall for the selection and installing of another overseer. And so <clears throat> while there would be considerations, it's not like, okay, the, the, the previous pastor said, well, I want my son to take the congregation. Well, that can definitely possibly happen, but the process is not that it is an inheritance. That makes sense to everybody. Because the government in the structure was such that is tied to the lines of authority. And that's what's being noted here. That it's not supposed to be seen as well, you know, this is a, a bloodline thing, you know. Back with the Levitical priesthood, it was. From the line of Aaron, it was. But even still then, the person who would receive the office of Kohen had to have a proper moral life or they might find themselves six feet under as we would say mm -hmm. say why would you say that why would you because those who occupied those offices of the priesthood if they did not live right the pattern was the most high would remove them mm -hmm. literally remove them mm -hmm. you see that with uh sons of uh, of Aaron, the first Kohen, you know, his, his sons brought forth strange fire. In other words, they were not doing the sacrifices in the right manner, and the Most High killed them. Uh, canon number 53. Canon number 53 primarily has to do with those who are new to the faith, just coming into the things of Elohim, and desiring to be a overseer. <clears throat> so the scripture teaches us, with regard to those who desire the office of oversight, that it is not a novice, not someone new to the faith, as the Apostle Paul put it, less being puffed up, they fall into the snare of the devil. And so here we have a number of things noted here. One has to do with one who has been lately baptized. <clears throat> it says, shall not be ordained as bishop. Basically, someone who just gets baptized. That's an indicator that they're new to the faith. All right? And then it says, he who has come from among the Gentiles. Now this is interesting that this particular statement is noted. He who has come from among the Gentiles. Do you know why that statement is made? The statement is made primarily because during this time when these apostolic canons were put together, they still understood themselves to be Israel. So someone who was from the other nations, when they would come in, they had to be acclimated to the house of Israel. You see? 
Much of the time when we read these ancient documents and we see statements like this, sometimes they're just glossed over, you know, because the modern Western church has put forth the idea that Yahshua came and what he did, he basically said that the law has been put aside, I have fulfilled it, therefore it is uh, not needed for this new covenant church and this new covenant church is going to reflect all of the cultures of the world. But that wasn't the idea and that wasn't the case and that was not the expression in the first and second centuries. It was very much an Israelite community, people that continue to keep the Shabbat, yes. continue to keep the Moedim, who were regarded as a sect of the Nazarenes, very much a threat to the sect of the Sadducees, so much so, uh, and the Pharisees. So much so, they were a threat to the Pharisees that the Pharisees had to create a document called the Shimone, or the 18 Benedictions. How many of you ever heard of the 18 Benedictions? And in the 18 Benedictions, they specifically created a particular, it's a curse, is what it is. It's not a blessing because it says, curse be the Menim and the Notsuri. Basically what it's saying is, cursed are all of the other sects within, within Israel. The term Menim refers to the sects, other, other groups, Israelite groups that were not a part of the Pharisees. And then they specifically made specific notation of the Nosrim. That's the term in Hebrew for the sect of the Nazarenes. Because after the destruction of the temple, the sect of the Nazarenes and the sect of the Pharisees were the two largest sects within the Judean Israelite community of the first century. I bet most people didn't know that. Yes, they were a thorn in the side. So much so, they created this so that when the people would make these declarations, it would immediately ostracize the whole sect of the Nazarenes. They did not want that influence to have any more place in the larger Judean Israelite community. That was the way of ostracizing the sect of the Nazarenes from the Israelite community. And that occurred roughly around about the end of the first century. Now I said all of that just to give credence to the fact that this statement that's made about he who comes from among the Gentiles, it's a statement that's made basically saying someone who comes into the faith that doesn't know about Torah, that doesn't know about how we do things, it's going to take some time for them to get acclimated. Someone who is a Judean Israelite already knows about Torah, but believes that Yahshua is Mashiach, they come into the faith, all right, they come in, but they're going to have to learn about who Mashiach is. They're going to have to be taught. They're going to have to be re-instructed in the Torah as to know what the uh, Torah and the prophets say in particular regarding Yahshua. So it's basically stating that those who come in and are new to the faith, new to the things of Elohim, are not to be looking towards spiritual leadership. This makes sense to everyone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that's basically what this is saying. And then it's also dealing with issues concerning those who are in ministry leadership, that they shouldn't be one that striving to chase after wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, you have some people whose heart is bent on getting rich. And Moshiach said, don't be like the Gentiles. He said what? You seek first the kingdom, right? You seek first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
He said, for no one can what? Serve two masters. They'll either love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve Elohim and the mammon. So for those who have hearts <clears throat> that's bent towards accumulating wealth, it will be very difficult for them to focus their attention on the feeding of the flock. Now, does that mean that a person should not work if they have to work for their substance? By all means, no. Many servants of Elohim that work for their sustenance. The Apostle Paul himself worked as a tip maker at his own business. And he himself noted many times how he and Barnabas worked day and night for their food when they went preaching places. He said, we worked for hours. We did not even require it of you, even though we could have required it of you because of our office. There are many people in Zion that don't understand that there is a requirement that the saints have towards taking care of their spiritual leaders. And I haven't even touched on any of that yet. Mm -hmm. I haven't even scratched the surface up. I hardly ever talk about it. But it's there. It's there. So I, I've learned some things that when we teach about it, we have to teach about it from a perspective where believers have to see the fullness of whatever the subject is so that they can get it. That's how you have to teach. Because we live in a generation where there, where there is a great disrespect that has uh, come up against those who are ministry leaders. And what used to be a respect in generations past, it has been diminished. So then, <clears throat> when we look at canon number 53, these are some of the things that we see. That those who choose to be led of Elohim to uh, occupy a position of ministry oversight, it needs to be someone who is mature in the faith, someone who is not a novice, someone whose heart is bent towards doing the things of Elohim and pursuing the work of ministry. Canon number 54. Canon number 54 is another one of those canons that has to do with ensuring that the person called to the ministry is not divided, divided, excuse me, when it comes to their priorities. And so in this particular one, it speaks of a person who joins the army. That's what it says. Bishop or an elder or deacon who connects himself with the army and desires to perform these two offices that he should follow a human calling and a priestly calling, let him be expelled. Now this is this is a tough one. This is how this is how they believe. They believe that if you're going to serve in the ministry, you you do not have you cannot have a divided heart about what you're doing. They believe firmly that a person who is called to the ministry needs to be focused on that. It needs to hone in on that. All right. <clears throat> so here we have these canons. They teach us about the mind of the apostles, how they understood the things of Elohim, how they took seriously their calling and work of service unto Elohim. And so what this does, it, it challenges us. It helps us to really begin to seek and to search out our own priorities as we strive to serve Elohim and also to examine our motives about everything that we are doing. Mm -hmm. And for those who are called into the ministry, if there are other things in your life, other passions, other dreams, this, that, or the other, and, I'm, and I would never say to someone, don't follow your dream, don't follow your passion, but this is a reality. If, if your dream or your passion is taking up more of your time from pursuing the scriptures, 
doing the work of Elohim, there is a problem. And no doubt about it, these ancient apostles had that same belief. They believed in a concept of being sold out to the things of Elohim. They believed in pursuing the work of Elohim and not allowing anything to interrupt that drive. And in my walk and in my life as a servant of Yah, I've had to do a lot of rethinking. I've had to do a lot of soul searching and to always examine what are my priorities according to the scriptures regarding the things that I am to do. Because all of this impacts our life. It impacts our relationships we have with others depending on what type of relationship you have. If you are a married person, then your married life, of course, has certain uh, responsibilities that are attached to that, that the Most High expects to be taken care of. If you are a person who is not married, then of course that gives you more, more uh, time to be able to pursue and put into the things of Elohim. Um, so as we live and serve the Almighty, and as we understand the mind of the apostles, because these apostolic canons, what they do, they, they uh, in my opinion, um, remove all doubt as to what the text of scripture might have been hinting at when we read the various statements that have been presented in the document. And so I hope that this has been informative, that it's been helpful, and that it helps to guide you in your thinking yes. and in your decision making, striving to do the will of the Father. So we bless the Most High for that.